All right, so I have a couple questions for you. Of course you do. How much water does one of those big tanker trucks hold? Yeah. Uh, they kind of vary. The, the truck that we just looked at is 750 gallons. Um, when when the pump has a capacity of 1,500 gallons per minute, that tank water doesn't last very long. So uh, a lot of times, what it is is a quick we get a hose off. And we we'll use our tank water to at least get the fire kind of knocked down, slow the progress, and then we get a hydrant hooked up. When you first go into a house that's on fire, what are you looking for right away? Um, the first thing I'm looking for is signs of occupants. Um, so a lot of times we, we, we'll show up the house, we don't know if somebody's in the house. We don't get the kind of information. The things that I'm looking for are their vehicles in the driveway. When I come into the front door, if that's the door I come in, are their shoes laid out in coats, right? Because when the occupants are gone, usually they take their vehicle, they take their coats, they take, they take their shoes. There's just some, some things I'm looking for. I'm also like, listen, is somebody, somebody hollering for help? Um, our first priority is life safety. Our second priority is property preservation. So it literally could be if we suspect that there's someone in the house, before we even start fire suppression, we're doing a quick primary search. The quick down and dirty, going through each room, making sure uh, the, the, the house is clear. How hard is it to see when you get one of those houses? Um, visibility is typically zero. Uh, I can go in, my partner could be literally arm's length from me and I see that person. So my eyes are taken away. Uh, guys that have glasses, it doesn't matter. They, they don't wear the glasses with their face piece on because visibility is zero anyhow. Uh, we have to rely on a couple different things. Uh, feel and, and our sense of hearing. We have what's called a thermal imaging camera. They've come a long ways. I remember the first thermal imager I saw, it was like $25,000 piece of equipment. Now we can get them for about seven grand, and they're small, about this big. Essentially, it's a little camera that, that finds variations in heat sources. So I can pan the room, and I can find a body pretty quickly. Uh, it used to be when I first got my fire service, it was literally crawl in, and you're just feeling for bodies. Now I get to the front door, I pan the room, and I can see through that smoke with that camera. Um, I can see variants in heat. So you can see the outline of the body. A lot of times, I've had fires where I don't know where the fire's at. The smoke is so thick that you crawl in and you're like, oh, I don't think the fire's in this room. That thermal imager will find the fire for you. So. Uh, they're already out. Um, so there's companies that have them that uh, the thermal imager is built into your face piece and it, it attaches to uh, somewhere on your air pack. Um, they're really cool. They work really well. They're very, very expensive. How do you tell, like, when you're going in there, it's like you said, you can't see the fire, and you know where the fire at? Um, well, today we use the thermal imager, so I can see the fire very clearly through the thermal because it picks up the heat of the fire. Um, before we had thermal imagers, you just went by the feel of the heat. The hotter it gets as you enter this house, you know you're getting close to the fire. Um, I, when I first started, yeah, we didn't use thermals. You just crawled in, and it's hot, it's hotter, it's hotter, it's hotter. Oh, hey, there's a fire. Um, a lot of, there was a lot of, back in the day, a lot of blind spraying water hoping that you're hitting a fire. So, just, I know it's one thing when you go to a fire scene, you also set up a big pan. Does that help draw the smoke out, or is it just, what's that? Um, so, that's called positive pressure. Um, if we were to draw the smoke out, that's called negative pressure. Uh, we don't do a lot of negative pressure anymore if we use what's called positive pressure. So we put, uh, and I showed you guys this fan that's in the back compartment of the truck. 
moves a lot of air really, really fast. What it does is it pressurizes the house and it pushes the, the heat and the smoke out and makes the environment a little more tenable for us to work in. The thing with uh, using that fan is we have to do what's called a coordinated attack. So when the, the crew that's assigned to ventilation starts to ventilate, they have to be in contact with the crew that's ready to drag hose in and fight fire because that fan will blow that heat and smoke out, but it also makes our fire grow very rapidly. You're, you're um, adding oxygen to the environment. And, and so once you start that fan, you've got to have your crew at the door ready to go in and, and suppress. So is there some science behind it? There is some science behind it, yes. We call that fire science. What is the hardest fire Um, some of our more difficult fires are um, older structures that have been um, remodeled multiple, multiple times over the years. And there's void spaces, um, little nooks and crannies. And what happens is the fire, uh, it's not just in a room where you can find it. Sometimes it is, a lot of times it is. A lot of times the fire will get into a wall, it'll get into a chase, it'll get into uh, void spaces between floors, attics. So you're doing a lot of chasing the fire. Those are your hardest to put out because they're hidden. And if you don't get it completely, guess what? A couple hours later, you're coming back. You've got a house that's still on fire. Let's turn on one time about my house. I was looking at some precedents. How do you guys really wrap up residuals on the property? Are you looking for pictures and stuff like that that you gave me? Mm hmm. Um, could you touch on about why you would like to find viable stuff in the house to do that? So that's, uh, we call that salvage. Um, so salvage begins. If, if possible, salvage begins as soon as we get there. Uh, say, if we have a second story fire and we've got a crew up there fighting fire, we have a crew probably downstairs gathering your belongings, putting them all together, putting a tarp over them so they don't get water damage. Um, salvage could be putting everything in the middle of the room, putting tarps over it. Uh, it could be taking it outside so it's completely out of the house. Um, our biggest goal is, is property wealth, life, life preservation, but also property preservation. We don't want to go in and make more damage than what the fire's already doing. We know that we have to spray water. There tends to be more smoke and water damage than actual fire damage, and we know that. So we want to get your belongings out, or at least things covered up. There are things, you know, pictures and, and, and sentimental things that insurance just can't replace those things. And we know that, so we're going to try to preserve your stuff. What's the biggest fire you've been on? Probably the Tama building. I've actually been to the Tama building twice for it for burning. And then, and then I uh, went to a train wreck in Iota in the late 90s. Uh, a train that actually derailed coming across from Port Madison into Illinois. Um, and then once, it, once the, the engines got across the, the bridge and around the curb, they, they turned over. Uh, I think we figured it spilled about, about 12,000 gallons of diesel and it, and it burned. So it was a big fire over there quite a while. That building was like downstairs kind of scary, David. David building was a little scary, yeah. Yeah. They had a uh, firefighter that was in the alley side that had to collapse. Luckily there was a spot for the fireman. He was able to get into a parking spot that protected him from being trapped. <coughs> 
Yeah, we had three three different collapses that night, and all three times I, I thought we lost personnel. We were very fortunate. No collapse on the east side. I had officers on that side. And I couldn't reach my radio. Yeah, that was that was terrifying. Yeah, we had we had a, we had an aerial on on that east side when it collapsed, and I thought that I thought it killed that crew. Mm -hmm. I, I was very much expecting for that crew to be dead. That was the first one I've seen on that one, big fixer. Yeah. I forgot, how did we get the lady off the second floor? How did we manage to do that? We had, we had an engine two, engine two is a quint, so I had a short little 65 foot ladder on it, and we got it down to that. Because our aerial was out of service for that fire, so we had to call in each leg for aerial devices. Um, yeah, we got it down with, uh, with a quint. So do you train often with other agencies? <laughs> we do, we do train often with um, so uh, when we have when we have trainings, uh, say like uh, we just we just had the driver operator class, which is a, a four day class. <clears throat> uh, we invited area departments to come in and sit on that you know, in on that class. Um, we we do a lot of training with West Burlington because we have a, a an auto aid agreement. Anytime we have a structure fire, West Burlington send in a truck and a crew of people, and vice versa. If they have a structure fire, we're sending a truck and a crew of people. So we do a lot of training together. Um, we have a really good working relationship with all the volunteer departments in, in the county. And they're always, always welcome to come to our trainings. They, they return the favor if they have a, a special training. A lot of times we'll go there. I've heard them say strike the box. What's that mean? Strike the box. Um, so we have a, it's called a box alarm system. So when I get to a fire, if I need resources, I'm not going to tell the dispatcher, I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that, and I need this. I just say, I need, I need to strike a box. The first box is just simply, we have a structure fire, it calls back 10 off duty firefighters. Um, and then it, and it brings uh, Mediapolis Fire to sit in our fire station, and then it brings Danville Fire to sit in West Burlington's fire station. That's our first box. Second box would be all department personnel and more departments. Um, so each box gets kind of a, a pre-package of resources. So you don't have to sit there and tell dispatch Everything you need, just say, I need this particular box. They have a little card there at DESCOM. They look, okay, I know what that box is. I'm going to start getting those resources. Um, final question I have for you is uh, how valuable is it when the police officers show up on the scene? Because they're usually there first. What would you like them to do? So, uh, very you guys have to work as a team. Yes. Uh, you know, and we have a, a really good working relationship, at least from my perspective, with with our officers. Really respect our officers. Uh, they are a lot of help uh, with... There are a lot of things that need to be done that we don't have the personnel to do. Uh, it could be something like traffic control. We have a vehicle fire, and I need a lane of traffic shut down, and officers do that. And I know that that officer is watching and making sure that I'm safe to do my job in traffic. Um, evacuation, um, our officers are really good. Were you at the uh, at Autumn Heights tonight? We had a, a fire up on the seventh floor. I wasn't on that. So <clears throat> we, had a, we had a working structure fire at Autumn Heights on the seventh floor. <clears throat> The, the biggest challenge was we were overwhelmed from the get-go with, with the evacuation process. We had personnel dragging hose and equipment and stuff for fire suppression, but we needed to evacuate. To make the situation worse, when their fire alarms go off, the elevator system shuts down. It's a safety feature, okay? So we have handicapped and elderly on the seventh floor to have to get down to the first floor. So PD was really, really, really helpful with our evacuation. Um, 
I don't, 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 I don't